Harrison, and um, I was a student of AMA's. And I first uh, just want to begin with um, talking about um, my experience as a student and later as his TA. Um, Dr. Singh brought up how uh, in the book we get sort of this, um, um, I forget the word, the term you use in terms of the contrast of Amy's. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous and a little emotional. Um, the contrast between his position, right, his gentle position, yes. and what comes across in the book, right? And I actually, the um, soft voice. The soft voice, right? And I actually thought for a moment, hmm, I'm not so sure about that because I watched him in action in class. <laughs> and that soft voice was so penetrating <laughs> that one could only just put your head down and just start taking notes, right? One could only sit there and try to formulate a question that was deep enough to meet <laughs> where what he just told you. Um, Aimee helped me to imagine the possibilities. And he always talked about this. And I was always like, Aimee, what is this imagining the possibilities? And he would sit and talk and he'd talk with his hand and he would talk about, we need to talk in this way. And what are the, but say more about that. And when I was his TA, his students would come, the undergrads, and it's an upper level, so they're juniors and seniors, they would come at, to me as a TA, right? And, you know, what does he mean, say more about that? And I'm like, you need to say more about that. <laughs> you can't stop with your analysis because it's always a step further. And so he really challenged me in that way. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm defending uh, my dissertation in two weeks, and this is also very bittersweet because my project actually came from the fact that AMA um, encouraged me to go to London in 2008 um, with the study abroad, and I traveled with the study abroad program, and that's where I, that was my first time in London, that's where I came across these newspapers, that's where I came across, um, he encouraged me to visit the Marxist, Marxist Festival 2008, um, the very first festival I went to, they were talking about socialism and feminism, and I'm like, and we're the women of color. Because I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. This is, this is my first week in London. And so I was on Skype with Aimee like every other day, because he, could, he couldn't come to London. And I was asking him these questions, and he would sort of give me guidance. And so my, my, my coming to the questions that I finally came to, and towards a transnational black feminist discourse really came from Amy's pushing at me, well, these are the questions you need to ask. Go find it. And the fact that I even asked that question came from the fact that I was trained under him, right? And so I, as I read this book, it, yeah, as I read this book, I saw all of that and I heard his voice. And I've heard him give the D'Angelo talk before. And so it was nice to see it, to read it, and to remember those things he emphasized. And to remember the audience reaction when he talked about um, the video, when he started talking about the camera and the uncomfortability of people in the audience when it was like, wait, are, and this was actually at ASALA, the Association for the Studies of African American Life and History, which is, you know, debatably more history oriented and we had a little discussion after that session about how they didn't get it because these historians are into theoretical and <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but there was this, um, there was more an uncomfortability with the fact that he was reading this black man's body in a context in which we were afraid to go or we have been afraid to go in the context of African American history. And he, he even talks about, he draws on uh, Mark Anthony Neal's Soul Babies. And Mark Anthony Neal is one of the, uh, does uh, black masculine studies, gender studies. And he even, you know, talks about the limitations. Mark Anthony Neal couldn't go that far. So what is it about Aimee's intellectual development that made him 
push the envelope? And I don't have the answer, but that was, for me, an inspiration, and it's something that I wish to model myself as a scholar after. Um, and so my work, what I've been doing for the past couple months, um, and thinking about towards the transnational black feminist discourse, what this book on black masculinity brought up for me was, hmm, what types of questions now do I, as a black feminist, as a gender scholar who centers black women in her writings, what do I now have to engage? Because black feminists have never been, it's just the women, right? It's always community, right? And so part of community are black men. And one of the tropes that is salient, <coughs> one, not like the prevailing trope, it's arguably argu arguable, but um, in black feminist uh, writings and language is that of survival. So, and I thought about this, I'm like, hmm, on one hand, if, if it is true that black men, black poor urban men are shaped by a death defiant or are living in a death, um, death bound framework, what's going on with the women in their lives, whether it's their sister, their mothers, their uh, daughters, <coughs> and if those women are shaped by a survival mechanism. Are they one and the same? And I think Professor Singh brings this up, right? These are questions that, like, you know, even as we're talking about death, there's really a life here to be lived, right? And so one of the things that comes out in black feminist writing is that we don't engage that. And he, you know, he, on page nine, he talks about hooks and how hooks, you know, attempts to talk about black manhood, but doesn't go far enough, and it's because she doesn't understand that death-bound subjectivity that is specific to black males. <coughs> and there's a reason why, right? Because black feminists haven't been able, this is, I don't think we've talked about it in this way. And, and there are people who talk about racial terror, and he, you know, Sudia Hartman and Hazel Carby, there are people who talk about it, but not in this way, and not in this way in, in terms of our community and in which we're interacting with each other from these different frameworks. So for me, this is something that, you know, these are the questions that came up for me. And um, the other piece of it is because I am a diaspora scholar, I thought about this book as, um, although there are mostly like US-based examples, um, I have like a little spiel right here. <laughs> I'm just gonna read this. The examples even in the book, although US based, are um, wholly global conversations because of the market of hip hop. We talk, and he talks about sort of, you know, we know about the vast marketplace of hip hop and technology. And so not only do we have the exportation of lyrics and images and of this like bad nigga image or the fuck the world mentality, but um, this export, exportation of the idea of what black American life is. So again, and, and it's very masculinized, and it's and arguably always has been masculinized from the hip hop point of view, right? But again, what is the role, on what, uh, what is the voice of black women in this? And it's important to, to be able to insert and have these conversations. Even as this is a book on black masculinity, there's, a, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, and what's my response? And what's my response? So this is, and, and in terms of the global um, sphere, it's not just what is my response as a black U.S. woman, but what are the responses of black African women, or what are the responses of the my my case studies in black British and you know black political identities become convoluted with you know uh, ethnic um, backgrounds, but these are the types of questions that I thought about and ultimately. You know, when I asked Aime what his book was about, and this is um, before he was sick, and this is when I was taking his class, before my comms, this is when I was just sort of like, I was fascinated with him talking about the possibilities, and he said, I'm queering hip hop. And I said, you know, I think about it, what does that mean? What do you mean you're queering hip hop? And it wasn't just about, I'm making everything homoerotic, but I am about to change, I'm going to introduce some ideas that 
are going to reshape the ways in which we've put hip hop on this sort of political pedestal, um, this um, very political masculinized pedestal. And we can add a bunch of adjectives <coughs> where that, <laughs> where hip hop falls. But ultimately, I've been waiting for this for a while and I'm so glad to see it come to fruition. So.